Get the popcorn, Frank. Coming, dear. Right? Or the cottage in Maine. Or the cottage someplace. Because remember, the same rules that I just went through for you would apply to the value of that cottage. So if Frank and Mary, in addition to the assets they had, had a place in Maine that happens to be worth $300,000 or a place on the Cape which is probably worth $600,000, right? Then for Mary to qualify for Mass Health, Frank would have to sell that property, turn the, and therefore turn it into money, then add that money to the other money that he's going to use to buy that annuity. But the problem is that takes a lot of time. And in the meantime, that means they had to sell the cottage which they probably didn't want to do because Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. probably all go use that cottage, you know? All the grandchildren go there. So it, it, that's the one asset if you are, or that's one of the assets if you are married that you may want to put into an irrevocable trust for the benefit of your kids. Name one of the kids because typically that's the asset that the kids want to preserve anyway. Everything else, you know, they don't care about your house, you know, and they don't really care about the annuity, but they really would like to know that in the long run, they can still go to that place in Maine that they love going to, you know, with the grandchildren and everybody. So that may be the one asset that you want to put in trust um, early on in, in an irrevocable trust and wait the five years. A second one is, the, is if you got any other things that are kind of big, people often will, I literally had someone talking to me yet, yesterday or the day before, and we were going through all of this, um, actually because they've got, you know, Mrs. is in the nursing home and Mr. was talking to me. And we mentioned the house, so we're going to shift that and blah, 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 right? And he says, oh, yeah, and I got a trailer. Oh, you have a trailer? He says, yeah, I got a trailer on a lot in Maine, right, in Wells, and it's worth $90,000. Well, you know, that's the same thing as having a cottage, right? You've got this big, big asset. That may be an asset that if you want to keep it, you, you probably want to put it into some kind of trust and get those five years to run. Otherwise, you're going to have to sell that or Frank would have to sell that if Mary went in the nursing home. So, uh, the other one, I always refer to that lot in Florida. Inevitably, not inevitably, but so many people have a lot in Florida, you know, that hasn't been built on and it's been sitting around and it's got some kind of value. That lot in Florida is going to cause you no end of grief, right? So if you've, if you've still got the lot and you really want to keep it, then maybe you want to put it into an irrevocable trust. If you've still got the lot, and you're now 75 years old and you know you're not going to build that house, get rid of that lot, right? Because if you've still got it when you die, that means you're going to have to go through a Florida probate in order to get that, that lot sold. That is just painful, right? So it, there, are, there are a few times where you'd want an irrevocable trust, but in general, no. So the only time that an irrevocable trust may be necessary would be, say Frank had died, hadn't done any of this kind of planning, so Mary inherited everything, and then Mary is going to the nursing home, right? Now we've got a problem, as we were just discussing, right? Mary would need to spend down all those, you cash out the IRAs, pay the taxes, cash out the annuity, pay the penalty, pull out all the money, spend it all down on nursing home care. The price right now of that nursing home care is about $150,000 a year, so that money would get burned through in about two years. At that point, she would qualify for MassHealth, but MassHealth would put a lien on the house to make sure it got repaid at the time of her death. Now, if Mary came in to me because Frank had died and they hadn't done any planning, and once again, this happens regularly. People say, oh, my spouse just died. I really want to do something to protect the house. I'll have to say, you know, if you had get, just gotten to me before your spouse died, we could have, you know, put it in his name, changed the will, blah, blah, blah. But if that's not the situation, then you want to consider transferring the house to an irrevocable trust, right? And keeping a life estate in the house. That's the, t the and, and many of you people have heard about that. Some of you have done that, right? That may be a great, and, and I guess the, and the question and then you will have done that and you kept a life estate and then from the moment you did that you started counting the days, right? Because you knew 
there's this magic five-year clock, right? And if you get past the five-year clock, then if you go to the nursing home, the asset is safe, as long as the trust is valid, as long as the trust is valid. And that's where um, irrevocable trust provisions to avoid. That is where uh, Roach versus Thorne comes in. So uh, this year, actually at the very end of last year, uh, there was a case involving um, an old, a lady whose husband had died, and she had, a, and she had transferred her house into an irrevocable trust. And she had kept a life estate. And she was in the nursing home, and one of her kids was doing her stuff on her behalf and so applied to Mass Health. And it had been five years, more than five years, actually it had been about eight or nine years, um, and went and applied to Mass Health. And Mass Health denied the application, saying that, Mary, that, 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 um, the, that the applicant was over asset because they counted the entire value of the house. Oh, that's not good. <laughs> that is not good. That is something that has sent kind of ripples through the elder law community. And a lot of us are kind of thinking about this because we've seen, we had seen cases like that at the caseworker level, where the caseworker would, would deny. But typically, there, it, within Mass Health, there is an administrative appeal process. If the caseworker that's assigned to your case denies your case, you can appeal that to an administrative judge. They're judges that are actually hired by Mass Health. But, you know, that's what you get. And, and, and typically those judges would, would overturn that. Uh, this, this judge didn't, right, but upheld the caseworker's position. And that case is now pending in uh, Middlesex Superior Court. Now, the reason why, or excuse me, in Worcester Superior Court, and the case is called Roach versus Thorne. And the, but the reason why I mention this case is this was not a random caseworker or appellate law judge decision. This position regarding this has been being pushed by Mass Health now for the last two years. And now they're getting some results. And I can tell you that in general, the position of judges when they are reviewing these cases is they give very broad deference to the administrative law judge, which they are supposed to do. So I want to talk about what, was, what appears to have been wrong with that trust. 